Okay. Right. Well, first off, Louisa, Kumi, thank you very much for taking the time. I really do appreciate it. And uh, yeah, I'm very excited to talk about the future of activism with both of you. But uh, just to get the ball rolling, um, perhaps if we could just start with a, a personal question. And I think it'd be really interesting just to hear from you um, directly. You know, how did you get involved in activism in the first place? You know, was there a particular moment or experience when you realized I am an activist and this is what I want to do with my life? Perhaps Kumi first, because you've been in the game longer, and then Louisa. Oh, I'm, I'm much more looking forward to Louisa's answer, but I got involved as a 15-year-old in the fight against inequality in education in the, under the apartheid system. Uh, the slogan at the front of the first march that I was engaged in was, we want equality, meaning we want equality in education. By the time the slogan got to the kids right at the back of the march who were younger, they were saying, we want a color TV because they thought that slogan we were chanting at the front. If I'm, I'm brutally honest, at the age of 15, I probably wanted equality and a color TV almost equally. And right now, when I say we need a color TV, I say it in a way <laughs> that we need to have a way to equalize the communications deficit we have to be able to com you know, communicate the climate struggle. But so that was my start. And uh, as is often the case, um, governments overreact to peaceful civil disobedience. And we were expelled from school. The decision of the government to expel many of us from school actually turned us into dedicated long-term lifetime activists for justice in most cases. So I always say to governments, uh, don't think your repression actually <laughs> delivers a result. It usually backfires really badly. Uh, and then after that, you know, uh, we lived under terrible repression. Uh, actually, today, as we speak, is the anniversary uh, of the killing of my best friend and four young and, and um, eight young activists in Durban. So I, I got uh, involved in a context of where there was a lot of struggle, a lot of death, a lot of sadness, but we came out of it with love, with the with, uh, reconciliation with a sense of justice. And that's what I've tried to carry in all my activism with the inspired by leaders like Nelson Mandela and Archbishop Desmond Tutu. It's a, uh, it's very interesting because I would, I would think that the context where I come from is almost diametrically the opposite context. Um, you know, from an urban uh, area in Hamburg, my, uh, my parents went to university and, uh, you know, I was um, I'm the, you know, Merkel generation. I didn't know any other chancellor than Merkel. And, you know, uh, nobody would, nobody that I knew would be voting for her. But every time again, she was getting chancellor. Everyone was very much okay with it. And, uh, you know, that was a big, big story of my, my childhood was, you know, Merkel will do it. And uh, also, by the way, another big story of my childhood was there won't be another war in Europe. Both hasn't very much worked out. And, um, and it was this, um, you know, I grew up being told this fairy tale of the systems kind of working out. So, you know, if you just work hard enough, the, the you will get it back. Um, if there is still, you know, discrimination against women, well, it's an accident in a system that's actually just progressing and getting more equal for everyone. And um, it was this time when everyone was sharing these charts, you know, more education for everyone, less hunger, less poverty. It was you know, it seemed all very much worked out and that was very much what I was being told. And I was also told that, you know, if you look just after yourself and, um, you know, there isn't many other responsibilities really, you know, no, nobody expected you to look around and see like the bigger picture or so on. It was, you know, about to get good education and a good job and a good career and all these things. And it's um, when then I learned about the environmental um, problems of our times, I was so irritated to see how, how normalized it was to talk about ecological devastation and then the bell rings and we leave the classroom and it's almost like this devastation doesn't exist anymore. It's like, it's an interesting issue for the classroom, but it was um, not the reality. And um, I then started to do something like, because I was, I was educated, I was started studying geography. I, I met people like uh, Bill very early on and I started doing something which I would now retrospectively call handshake activism. It is this kind of activism that looks very, very good on your CV. 
it is something that you do, but you wouldn't miss out on many other things for it. It is something that you might be very dedicated to, but you're also very keen to, to, to meet an important minister, to shake their hand and take a photo and, you know, prove that you've actually done something. And most importantly, you wouldn't really look after, you know, what you've achieved after all. It is a charity um, kind of, you know, engaging. And um, it worked out very well. You get rewarded for that. Um, you know, you, it, it fits the system. It is something that's even considered, you know, working out on your career. And it took me really, um, you know, this very, very dry summer in, in Europe in 2018, the IPCC, the 1.5 to be coming out at the same time, and our government deciding on a coal exit that, was, that would stop us from ever reaching our, our Paris promises, that I felt like, wow, well, something isn't working out here. Like, this doesn't make sense. And you have to ask yourself, what are you doing here? And then, luckily enough, um, long story short, I, I bumped into Greta Thunberg in the climate conference in, uh, in Poland. And I looked around and I felt like, wow, that is the only person in the room that is, you know, you know, acting like there is an actual crisis around. And I felt way too old to start a school strike. But then I realized, you know, maybe it's time for me to not care about the age so much. And uh, I went back home and we set a trial as a future in Germany. And um, there's an interesting moment then. Um, then I didn't yet feel like an activist really, but it was a similar situation as Kumi talked about that a government wanted to very quickly, you know, buy us in. And um, they, they met with us and then they wanted to, pro uh, to prohibit our first big strike. And I looked around and was like, what? That is the answer of a democratic country to young people engaging in politics? Something is very much wrong here. And uh, then I turned around and I introduced myself to a journalist saying, hello, I'm Louisa and I'm a climate justice activist. And I think, you know, uh, that's, uh, that's what, after all, our answer needs to be to those kinds of, um, you know, yeah, reactions. Neil, Neil, can I engage with Louisa on some of the most amazing points that she she raised briefly. So, so Louisa, uh, the what you call the handshake activism is what I, in reflection on a lot of my activism and time spent, is where I say that the mistake my generation of activists made was that we mistook access for influence. Just because we got access allowed some uh, government official or minister or CEO of a big company to tick off a box saying civil society consulted. And quite honestly, it also meant that many of us who were engaging in those interactions and we must be, there's no time to tell lies and claim easy victories. Now is the time Absolutely. for absolute brute uh, truth. And so I have no hesitation in putting up my hand now and saying on reflection, Mia Kalpa, I also made a tactical error. I ask every one of us who have been around for a long time to reflect honestly. What we did was we went back and ticked the box saying government was lobbied. And actually, when I reflect on many of those engagements, they were completely ritualistic. Meaning when I went into the meeting, I knew what they were going to tell me at the end of the meeting. They knew what I'm going to tell them in the meeting. In the end, it was theatrics and tick box ticking exercise. The second thing that you say, which I think uh, I have to reflect on, which is about working within the system, right? Most of us in my generation tried in good faith to push the current system beyond what it was designed to do. In fact, to a large extent, we used to say things like, the economic system is broken, the energy system is broken, the agriculture system is broken. But actually, quite frankly, after more than four decades of activism, I must humbly say that I read it wrong, that actually the system was not broken at all. The system is yeah. performing exactly how the system was designed to perform, right? It was to benefit a handful of people at the top, give people at the middle a little bit more so that they will feel that they have a vested interest to defend that system and then it comes to the majority who are primarily in the global south and are marginalized. Not to say that there isn't, by the way, a global south in the global north, and that is not to say there isn't absolute privilege in the global south by a handful of people. 
So I just conclude by saying that one of the mistakes we made in 2008, 2009, after the global financial crisis was as, as a global community was we should have seen that as a teachable moment, a moment to understand that our systems were rotten to the core, that were beyond incremental tinkering and rearranging deck chairs in the Titanic, but required fundamental change. What we saw was system protection, system recovery, and system maintenance. What was needed then and what is urgently needed now is system innovation, system transformation, and system redesign. And uh, we will be lying to ourselves and to future generations to say at this moment in history, when the science tells us we got less than 10 years to, to, to turn things around, it would be arrogant for activism to not take into account what Albert Einstein said when he said the definition of insanity is doing the same thing over and over again, okay. expecting to get different results. So now has to be a time of extreme honesty, extreme courage, extreme boldness. Yeah. If activism is saying it cannot be business as usual, it cannot be government, government as usual, then surely we must be saying to ourselves, it cannot be activism as usual as well. Thank you. Nia, may I super quickly add a point? Go ahead. Uh, because I think, I think one big, you made, you made two points about, you know, but that's this kind of activism and also looking back, um, you know, a lot of it, Oh, a lot of what I could do back then, I was, you know, doing the nice meetings and, you know, ticking the boxes and doing that work that is a little stressful, but never very inconvenient. Um, something you can do because you maybe deep down don't, you know, feel the existential crisis, you understand it. But there's a, there's a big difference in that expression. I think one big, um, one big aspect that was missing from, from, from my work and I think from the work of many people back then was understanding the aspect of power and this, the dynamics of power. And that eventually the big questions, you know, go around who has the power to destruct and who has the power to stop the destruction. And understanding, you know, the big crises, if it's, you know, the ecological collapse, but also the big inequalities and so on as, as power dynamics and, and power plays, you know, is so fundamental to now the activism that I do now and understanding that what Pfizer Future did without even knowing it was building power. It was building up that strength from the bottoms with the children in Germany. We had 700 groups in 700 towns, meaning 700 strikes at one time coming together, lobbying, pressuring, you know, building up these capacities. And what you mentioned about these crises, I think that's a, such an important lesson. We see this now in the Ukraine um, war happening, where a lot of, especially the, the German, the European energy grids are being, you know, uh, you know, they have to be rapidly changed. And it's so interesting that at the beginning of the war, lots of people thought, well, now it's all on the table. You know, we will ramp up the renewables. We will ramp up the, 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 the fossil free energy because it's clear that, you know, to like renewables, you don't even have to be, you know, you don't have to be a climate activist or an eco nerd. It, it's enough to kind of mildly dislike Putin and mildly like democracies and freedom and safety. You know, that's where we are. So the argument was on the table. And I think you know, now we are seeing almost a, a fossil fuel backlash and in places like Germany, it's horrible to watch live, you know, live on TV, all the decisions, the, the fossil expansion really happening. There's new drilling happening in the North Sea coast. I mean, we have a green government. It is so, um, it is so absurd at, at one point, but also it tells us maybe one of the most important lessons of the climate crisis. And that is just because it makes sense, it won't necessarily happen. This is not about rational arguments. This is about power. This is about, you know, who has access to what and who has the power to, dis to distract. And uh, the choices will be in favor of fossil fuels if we're not, you know, challenging that. It's not about, you know, what is logical or what is financially more, you know, uh, the better option or what is, you know, economically spoken, maybe the wisest choice. This, it is not about these things. These things help, but relying on them brings us to the point of more and more fossil investments uh, being made everywhere. I just you, you've covered a lot of points there already. <laughs> very, very interesting. But just one thing, if I just take it a step back, just to also add a bit more context, maybe uh, for the viewer here. Um, Kumi, you were born in 1965. 
when um, the CO2 concentration in the air was at 322 parts per million. Uh, Luisa, you were born in 1996 uh, when it was at 364 parts per million. You also have that on your Twitter bio. Uh, today it's 421 parts per million, uh, which is about 50% above pre-industrial levels. Uh, and last year saw um, the global energy related carbon emissions rebounding <clears throat> by 6% to its highest level on record. So the trajectory we're on, it's really bad. And as The Guardian reported last month, fossil fuel companies are planning scores of new major oil and gas uh, projects, despite all we know <clears throat> about climate change, partly because yeah, fossil fuels are just making a huge rally on, on the mar markets now with the prices. But what does all this mean, given the trajectory we're on? And also, you know, if you reflect self-critically, what does this mean for climate activism? Kumi, you touched upon it a little bit. Um, has climate activism failed? And if so, you know, what needs to change? Well, I think this is a appropriate question for our time. And I think we must answer it without any uh, sense of uh, uh, any sense of being covered about it. The bottom line is we have failed to achieve what we needed to achieve by now. I come from a city called Durban, right? And five weeks ago, we had the worst storm we ever had. 600 people died. Some bodies were never achieved. Um, it hit directly in my community where the places of religious worship and so on that were there for 75 years and so on got washed away completely. Now, unfortunately, because it happened in Africa and didn't happen in a uh, European city or an American city, the world doesn't know about this as it should know on the scale. So let's be clear for the people in the global south who carry the least responsibility for the crisis of climate accumulation, people are paying the first and most brutal price. This is a climate injustice, this is climate apartheid, and this needs to be named as such. So therefore, uh, one of the things in response, if I might, you know, the way you framed it, which I liked uh, the way you did it, um, looking at, you know, what the parts per million were when I was born and when Louisa, I get it, Louisa gets it, but you know what the problem with, with, with the framing, and that's the way I, I talk about it as well. And I want to say that one of the things we stand accused of as the uh, activist movement around climate is far too often we are talking exactly like how the politicians talk about it and exactly how the scientists talk about it. But when we talk about it in that way, we are trying to move people solely on the basis of facts and trying to reach the sort of cerebral side. But our enemies, right, and the fossil fuel industry, they have done away with facts. They don't deal with facts. So they're not targeting the head. They are targeting the heart and they are tra targeting people's emotions and uh, uh, kind of terrorizing them about, you know, whether they are using uh, narratives about like what Trump used about this is a Chinese plot or whatever other reasons to confuse people. So I think that uh, part of what needs to be changing is also how we um, frame, there are many issues that hold us back communications wise, but I would just say that part of the problem is how we talk about it. We have not got sufficiently good at speaking in an accessible way where people who are directly affected, who should be players in the struggle, are currently in the observing it because we have not made the conversation accessible and we haven't opened the door wide enough to ensure that people with multiple skills, with multiple backgrounds, with multiple diversities can walk into the climate movement and say, this is ours and we will sacrifice and be part of it. We've started, but I don't think we should delude ourselves that we are anywhere close to where we need to be based on the scale of the challenge we face and the fact that we got a clock that is fast running out of time. Thanks. Louisa, would you like to add to that? Well, I, I absolutely agree. It's, uh, of course, a bit of a trick question for me, given, you know, I'm not that young, but I'm kind of young, I guess. And so I think, you know, I can talk about my activism and whether that has failed or like the time that, you know, I oversee but I wouldn't want to kind of, you know, judge on, 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 on the decades before. Um, 
Uh, I'm not sure if that is, uh, I think, you know, Kumi can, can cover that so, uh, uh, you know, so, so eloquently and uh, uh, rightly so. Um, I think though, and I think Kumi, you made a really important point about an intervention that is needed, an intervention on, you know, where we are and why we are where we are. Um, because, you know, we're looking at the timings, looking at the, at the, at the scales, we, you know, there, there can't be another failed, um, you know, decade of activism. There cannot be, you know, more movements emerging and, you know, finding out, well, okay, you know, we've tried this, you know, it did work out. So maybe someone else does. It is really about assembling the knowledge that's there and applying it, you know, to, to make it, it to, to prove it and, 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 and back it up as much as possible. I mean, there's always failing happening. Yet I think, um, yeah, there is a, a trial and error really doesn't work when, when there's no time to lose. So I think we must obviously, and by we, I would of course speak, you know, mostly about the, the movement that I know and the, the activists I know, but even, you know, on a larger scale, I think we must be much better in accepting that you know, it's always fun to to explore the wheel from you know from the beginning on, but you know we are we need to rely on each other. We need to learn from each other. We need to assess and be um, vigorously self-critical about things that worked out and things that didn't work out. And you know, one of them things must include under dis distincting, but you know, having a distinction between um, attention and success. You know, because often in in, in these times, especially through social media the attention um, that certain things bring is being mixed up with the, with the uh, power that is built or the, you know, the, the, the changes that are made possible. Um, this accounts of course, as well of the, the language that is used, story that is being told. Um, and I think, you know, that also must include untelling the things that are, you know, that have brought us so deep down into this um, fossil fuel age. I, I, I refer a lot to me when I was 17 and I just gotten my driver's license and I hated getting it because my uh, the, the, the teacher was a um, fan of the football club in the next city and that was of course a, a terrible time for me discussing um, uh, these these football uh, talks. I was, a, I was a soccer player for a long time and, um, and I came down, I got my driver's license and I told my parents now I want to do a road trip through Europe. And they looked at me and said, what Louisa? you hated the driving, it is super expensive and dangerous. Why the hell do you want to do a road trip? And I was like, I want to do it with my friend and we go to Spain and we do these things. And I was so angry because I really wanted it. And I was angry because I didn't really know why. And I look back now and I, I talked about this with my mom and she brought it up and said, what was that about? Of course, after all, you know, Europe has a, it has a functioning train network. You can't really just use trains. And I thought about it and what happens to teenage girls when every single Hollywood movie they watch about romance, about holiday, about finishing schools, includes cars, includes driving long distances. If, if, it, if it's all that I know about, you know, the world as an adult is you're truly free and happy and, and funny and, and, and pretty when you're in these cars. And this is, you know, this is a facility, you know, soaking in our, into our dreams, into our wishes, into, into what we're longing for, into what we think is a good life and a good career and a good relationship and, a, you know, and a, and a happy end. And I think, you know, we, we need to dismantle those. Yeah, it is a belief system, a fossil fuel belief system um, to, to understand why people are behaving the way they are, because um, yeah, to, to a degree to, to, um, and to obviously retell the stories, you know, how they would work in a climate justice world. What is the, what is the good life for everyone, no matter where they are born? Uh, that doesn't depend on fossil fuel, that doesn't depend on exploitation and on profit accumulation with the, with the big industries and all these things. And so I think, uh, yeah, summing up, I think there's big need for, for, uh, for intervention and there's big need to, um, to uh, forget all about uh, reputation and our egos and uh, you know what uh, the, the legacy of, um, of all that has accumulated, there is no need, or maybe really there shouldn't be a need to facilitate all these things, but to rather, you know, rebuild um, power.
I love that turn of phrase, the untelling of stories and also retelling them, changing the narrative. Um, but if we look at, you know, what Kumi also said there about how do we reach people? How do we connect with people? How do we make them understand uh, what is at stake here? And of course, climate change, it isn't the only crisis we're facing. It's by far the biggest, but it's not the only crisis. And it often gets eclipsed by other crises. Yeah? We've come out of a global pandemic. Now there's the war in Ukraine. And, uh, you know, it gets bumped out of the news and immediately, you know, people are more worried about the rising costs of living, for instance, or getting their daily bread, especially in Africa, of course, it's going to be an issue with the Ukraine, wheat exports, etc. Um, so, I mean, how do you keep the fight against climate change in the heads, you know, and on the agenda of people, you know, against this backdrop is, I mean, how do you, how do you, how do you, how do you reach the ordinary working man who just wants to pay the bills at the end of the month and is probably you know part of the the vast majority in this world well you know one of the mistakes we've made uh, is framing climate change in a silo and we put it in something called an environmental issue and it's very important that one of the changes we need to see in activism moving forward is that we need to turbocharge intersectionality. We have to make clear how the question of extreme events relates to employment, in, in, in relates to uh, you know, relates to livelihoods and so on. Because even though politicians constantly try to push us into these silos and try to divide these, um, make these debates as if they are competing, they have to. You know, when I joined Greenpeace, maybe I put it this way. I was surprised so many journalists asked me the question in the first month that I was there. So you're giving up on poverty and you're going into environment. And I said, listen, as far as I'm concerned, the struggle to end poverty and inequality and the struggle to address climate change can, must, and should be seen as two sides of the same coin. So that is something I think needs a mentality shift on, on even on the side of uh, um, activism. And I think also, particularly Western-based environmental activism, must also do a deep reflect on how much of culpability it carries for holding back, for holding back that integration. And I can tell you, even as the head of Greenpeace, I confronted it both within Greenpeace and in the broader environmental movement, where there was the hesitancy for a whole range of justifiable reasons, perhaps. But it was sort of, oh, you know, our leaders will get very anxious if you bring, even the term climate justice, by the way. Well, you remember in 2009 in Copenhagen, we had no currency for climate justice. People like myself who were trying to push it were like sort of uh, saying, no, no, you know, we don't want to get the US government too anxious because then it'll be harder, they'll be worried about reparations and so on. So framing is, is, is exceptionally important if we're going to move forward. But I, I, you know, when you ask the question, how do we get ordinary people involved? I also think we also need to recognize why people hold the views that they currently hold that holds them back from being part of the story, right? And we need to understand that in, if you take a country like the United States, where you've got 40% of people who are watching one television channel called Fox News, which, do, which doesn't believe that it has simply a right to its own opinions, but believes it has a right to its own facts, right? What uh, one of Trump's advisors, Kellyanne Conway, called alternative facts, right? And so you've got a mass disinformation going on there that's holding back people from able to embrace uh, racial justice or uh, climate justice. And so um, the question is, from our side, do we continue to simply attack the people on the other side? Or do we get smarter and develop narratives and frameworks of conversation with people who disagree with us so we build a bridge to help them come onto our side? I strongly want to appeal today that activism cannot simply be about consolidating the people that already agree with us and who already roughly believe where we are and mobilize them, and then we become a very strong echo chamber. Activism has to be building bridges to the people that voted for Donald Trump and Brexit and so on, and to win them back on the basis of science, but science presented in an accessible way 
that goes beyond just trying to reach people through the head, but also through the heart by using arts and culture, for example. Just uh, one final question for me before I pass on to Bill, because uh, I don't hog all the time here. But uh, I mean, given the the pressure uh, that we're under, you know, to turn things around before we miss our climate targets, I mean, does climate activism need to take a more aggressive approach? Um, and where would you draw the line? Where would you say, okay, no, this is this is too radical, this is dangerous. We don't want to use these methods. Um, or does the emergency justify, you know, more than just civil disobedience? Um. I'm I'm sorry. I think my internet broke for a moment. But could I quickly say some uh, just a just a few sentences on the ordinary working man question? Because I think it's a and women, of course, not just men. And women. I was going to say, <laughs> yeah. So I think it's an interesting one because, for one, I would say, you know, many people like uh, taking a place like Germany. You know, we have um, you know, um, more than eighty percent of the people in favor of very, very strong climate action. We have two thirds of the young people being very worried about the future. Um, we have, you know, in all of the, you know, the elections, local election or governmental election, environment and climate is, is the top of the issue. So there is a large number of people that technically understand that there's something wrong, but they don't feel addressed when it comes to a call of action. And so I think the number one, you know, group of people that I, that I think about when it comes to, you know, mobilizing, building power, including people and, and collective action of any kind. Uh, I'm thinking of those who know what's going on, but who are in, you know, uh, who are at a place where they think, well, someone will take care and they forget for a moment that they are also someone that is needed at that very moment. And then there's this thing about the ordinary man and the, the so-called ordinary working man. And it's, it's, a, it's a big issue here in, in, in the media as well. And politicians ask us and say, oh, do you want to take away their jobs and their cars and everything they have? And I would just ask the question, is it fair for a car builder with a VW or, or a constructor of pipelines or, or you know, someone working in a coal mine, is it fair for that person, whether it's a, a man or woman, to work all day, every day, to pay the bill at the end of the month, knowing that means working against the security of the future of their children. Is it fair to put people at that place? And I would think no parent anywhere should be at a place where you know you're working in a system that is working for, for what is there right now, but is working somehow against your children. And I think that is not, you know, that is not a question of what do we do with some certain job questions, but this is, um, this has to do with equality and with justice and with treating you know with not putting people into a place where you play out the present against the future because you know there's no you can't distinct that and we are all intergenerationally connected and uh, assuming that their parents who don't care about their children you know or who care about them less than they care about themselves i'm not sure what kind of world that is that is but i'm not you know i'm not uh, taking that on and it turns out the moment we speak about the, with the people and we work a lot here with unions, for instance, it becomes very clear the transitions are happening. We will decarbonize, we will get out of fossil fuel. The question is just when, or I mean, fast enough and will it be just enough? And these things, these are the, the, the things we have to, to turn around now. And what we're seeing everywhere is that governments and the heads of those industries are delaying a transition that is already coming and already inside to the depend to the um, to the um, to the um, to the on the how do you say it That's to uh, yeah while you know to the cost of the people to the cost of the people working there who will have less time to adjust who will have less time to to learn something else who will have less time to maybe you know bond and fight for justice when it comes to those transitions. So it's it's up to us to you know to make to 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 tell the story of you know you know very 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 often people being on the same side here and it works out so we're seeing and you know the some of the the, the manufacturing companies that are building parts for um, the cars with with um, fossil fuel engines which will be banned in the EU after 2035 it's just agreed this this afternoon. Um, we talked to these people, we, we did coachings with them, we did trainings, we bonded, we, we found a common story and, um, you know, 
people started organizing in their own construction um, companies from Bosch, a big German company, asking not to be laid off, but for the company to transform. So they would build something for a fossil fuel infrastructure, a fossil free infrastructure. So that is, you know, I don't think this is about the climate movements against the ordinary man, but this is against, you know, about people against the fossil fuel profits, that it's, it's, it's about people uniting for justice and about understanding that people are to be played out against each other right now. And that's not an accident, that is a strategy. Louisa, Kumi, thank you very much. I'm going to have to hand over to Bill now. I've got plenty more questions, but I'm sure Bill has got them as well. So thank you very much. Well, Neil, thanks. Uh, what a fascinating conversation. Just back on these macro questions of organizing, I was struck in Glasgow looking around um, by how much had changed since Paris, uh, just in terms of the space that we have to do activism and how it's shrinking. Um, it, Kumi, you worked at Amnesty for years, so you've thought about this a lot. Um, it felt to me like a, a great deal of the world is now off limits for the kind of organizing that we've been trying to do. Uh, you know, China, Russia, Brazil, uh, Turkey, uh, Louisa, your counterpart in India uh, wasn't even allowed to come to the Glasgow conference and spent much of the year in jail. Um, that shrinking space how is that starting to influence, uh, and the U.S. was back, but briefly from the Trump years, uh, how does that influence how we think about the possibilities for the cascading change and the timescale we have? Go ahead, Louisa. Kuman, you want to start? No, no, you go ahead. Um, I mean, I don't have, you know, I can't really compare much, but... Um... What we are seeing, of course, is that um, you know the um, the repressions are real and they are growing into spaces where you know when I said activism, I thought it was you know this was happening. We are seeing that there is a you know uh, yeah a deliberate deliberate strategy into into very much not just repressing but oppressing. Um, and this, uh, you know, these takes very interesting um, turns. Um, you know, there are obviously the obvious cases where Disha from India, um, a wonderful activist, you know, you know, made news around the world for being jailed for for fighting for the farmers' rights. We have, um, you know, people in various other places. I think of my East African friends being fought back um, for fighting the ECO pipeline, the longest crude oil pipeline to be built in the world in East Africa. Um, but the but there is more nuance to it. It is not, it is not just the very, you know, the very brutal, the very um, open repression, but it comes down to, you know, implying in every single way possible that climate justice activism is inherently anti-democratic that it's against rights that it's about taking away something from people taking perspectives away about you know uh, doing something for a specific small group of climate people and against everyone else up to a point that you know two weeks ago the chancellor of germany olaf scholz on an open panel um compared climate activists in the audience that were disrupting to uh, to uh, people from a dark time that is thankfully thankfully um, long gone, and me and of course many many other people in the country understood that as you know implying that there would be an an S and an um, uh, you know a, uh, an ideology a totalitarian ideology behind behind the climate activists. And you know, um, there was never an excuse. There was never a clarification, even though it, you know, it traveled the world that we were outraged about this. And it's in these nuances as well, where 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 you try to take the democratic, um, you know, legitimacy away from there, from you know, German Chancellor all the way to the oppressions in South America and Africa and in many parts of Asia and India and so on. Louisa, I just love. How you start your answers by saying, I don't really know much about this. And then you get the most 
<laughs> absolutely brilliant answer. That's absolutely spot on. So that uh, sort of, I, I feel like a moment in the liberation struggle, if you follow something like that, you said, most of the really good points have been adequately made by the other speaker, but I will for emphasis that you spoke for a long time. But let me just say uh, that, uh, Bill, this is such an important question. Uh, Louisa made it very clear, but let, let's just put some facts on the table, right? About five years ago, Global Witness was recording about two environmental activists being killed every week, right? Now the figure is four environmental activists being killed every week, right? Uh, and I'm sorry to say that to a large extent, most of these deaths are invisible even to the mainstream climate movements around the world, right? Uh, why is there this disconnect we need to address? The second thing is, you know, this moment is a very ambiguous moment that we are in, right? On the one hand, right, this is such a moment of depression and sadness and anxiety because we are running out of time. The repression is increasing. We have more and more fascist leaders coming into power, leaders like the Chancellor of Germany describing the uh, climate movement in Germany, which is in the interests of the society, interests of current generations, future generations. When you have that kind of opposition, then you have to say things are really bad. But on the other hand, let me say that I do not remember, Louisa, any time in more than 40 years of activism where there are so many people in multiple movements who are saying now is the time, not for small baby step changes here and there and fixing this nut and this door falling apart, but this is a time for big, change. massive change. And so right now, even in the face of that repression, all I say to that is our response is we get smarter, right? Activism can operate even under the most vicious um, repressive conditions. It just means we have to be braver, we have to be smarter, we have to be more strategic, we have to take care. We should not be cavalier about it. Our lives are important. We should never be communicating the, uh, you know, that our lives are dispensable and we'll just throw it away, uh, you know, without thoughtful uh, application of uh, traditions of civil disobedience and so on. Mm -hmm. and, and so let's just be clear, when we say activism failing, is we have to also say that without the activism that we had, complicated and diverse and some really good and some really bad and so on, right? With not for all that, that constitutes activism, let's be very clear, it would be game up now. Let me, let me be very clear what I'm saying. We wouldn't even have a chance to live to fight this battle that we have to avert the worst that is coming at us. Wait, not for activism. And understand that that activism has always been against enemies, right? In the fossil fuel industry and media and so on, who are much better resourced than activism ever was able to be resourced, especially against fossil fuel companies. Yeah, I'm really glad you reminded us of the toll that's going on. I got to uh, sort of lead the memorial service at Glasgow for 231 people killed around the world in the last year um, doing environmental activism, and it does bring things into focus. One of the things that this says to me is that we have to, and I'm curious what you think, uh, that we need to expand uh, uh, the target set a lot. Um, our, our natural tendency as activists is usually to focus on governments um, because that's in a logical world how we'd make decisions and change and so on and so forth. Um, but given the degree to which uh, too, too many of our systems are now gamed by the very people that we're trying to uh, uh, go up against, um, it seems to me more and more important to be pulling the other lever, not just the one marked politics, but the one marked finance or money at the same time. It seems big enough that it's, and whereas an awful lot of the political power in say a country like the US has ended up in red states or around the world ended up in authoritarian hands, an awful lot of the money is still in places where we can get at it in 
New York and Frankfurt and London and Tokyo and so on and so forth. How do you see this work around banks and so on coming at, at this point? Where should we be leaning hard? I, I strongly believe that there are very few accelerated change strategies that are available to us to align the science and what extreme weather events and mother nature is telling us and our interventions on the other. There are very, very few. One of them is going extremely hard, extremely purposefully, extremely strategically against all forms of finance. So uh, uh, build the thing, we start together, divest, invest, focusing on uh, foundations, trusts, religious institutions, pension funds, and so on. And even though that is going great, it still can be turbocharged and do much better. But from that uh, to going after individual banks, going after central banks, because if we can convince the Federal Reserve, the Bank of England, and all the regulatory banks that it is not only in the climate interest, but in the economic interest of the investors, that they shouldn't be leading them down a road of investing in standard carbon assets, for example, then, and they, because they're not doing, they're not only failing in the environmental job, they're failing in the long-term economic job by not regulating in this way. And I think that uh, also the insurance industry that cuts across a lot of things is also a big player. So yeah, collectively as human beings on this planet, we have more wealth and capability than we imagine. I've seen it build as you know, in our own eyes in Australia, when the government was pushing ahead in 2015 to build the biggest coal mine, when the citizens in the country rallied and said to the banks, you will not spend a single cent of money, gotcha. not a single Australian bank, not a single Australian bank went against the will of the Australian people, as well as most international banks said they wouldn't. It slowed the project down, it shrunk it, but it's still alive because of the sort of fundamentalism uh, that is a associated with fossil fuel expansion in many parts of uh, the world, including Australia. Um, yeah, maybe just to add um, a few thoughts. Of course, I mean, you know, it is obvious that the power of the financial streams, and I think it is widely under, uh, um, you know, understated in, in places what this means, who has the power to invest, who has the power to divest who is funding the climate crisis and who is profiting from the climate crisis. Um, and uh, I think, you know, and, and I think, you know, the, the case you make for me about the public reception from industries, say banks and insurances mostly toward the public, that's, uh, you know, you, it's, it's so fragile compared to, to many of the governments. And we are um, talking a lot about the ECOP right now and, uh, you know, and the insurance uh, pro potential um, insurances of the ECOP pipeline pulled out after five tweets. You know, that's where we are. And that is, you know, you have a list and you can cross them off. And um, many, many banks pulled off. And I think um, what made a big difference with the eco problem project, and I mean, that's a, no, that's a half a gigaton, so that we have a, half a carbon bomb, basically that project alone. We, we, we sat down, and we made a list of the banks, of the insurances, of, of the investors, and we went to them one by one by one. Just a month ago, I spoke at Deutsche Bank, who were still maybe, you know, funding Total. And uh, it took, you know, five minutes for the speaker to say, oh, my God, I think we need to talk. And, you know, the, it, we are at a point that even people working at the bank would message me afterwards and say, thank God, we are, you know, we're so worried for what kind of place we're working and people need to speak out about it. What do we do? So there is this huge box to be open, to be uncovered, um, to be taken apart, you know, strategically and, and, and thoughtfully and so on. I think, however, um, we get to a point of shortcomings, and that is, of course, the question of greenwashing that is happening right now in the financial sector. Maybe the, one of the most prominent examples of that being the European taxonomy that would mean labeling, you know, fossil fuel gas as 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 sustainable. And so, of course, you know, these things work if there is a you know if there's some kind of system in place that can track those financial flows that can hold the banks uh, um that can hold the banks accord, um, accountable let me quickly um record this um voice i think i'm cracking a bit and so on of course we need to talk about regulation we need to talk about um we need to talk about the governments behind that 
that are also responsible and uh, where I think we need to include banks and money into our thinking about, you know, ending the climate crisis whilst, you know, very, very much holding the governments into account. And then I think that is a third pillar because of course, Kumi, you made this really important point about, you know, governments also working in a system that is and, and responding to a system. And I think that's why so much of our work was to think about how do we change the frames, the structure, the system in which, you know, parliaments and governments operate, that is a public space, that is the media, uh, that is the that is a fact, that is the accountability, that is the direct action that is needed, and so on. The uh, we got a good some good help in the last few weeks on some of this because there's new data that really makes it clear exactly how big some of this contributions are when people started figuring out how to add up the the carbon effect of the cash on hand at the big tech companies like Google or Microsoft it turns out that their emissions from just putting their money in the banking system far outstrip everything else they do in their entire line you know Amazon creates more carbon by putting cash in the banking system than with every delivery vehicle and warehouse they own. Netflix more carbon from its cash than everybody streaming every bad movie around the world every night uh, ad infinitum. So it, it, it's completely fascinating. Let me um, let me finish with, uh, with a quite self-serving uh, question that I'm eager to hear the answer to. Um, we're starting to do, having watched this wonderful rise of youth organizing, uh, exemplified by Louisa and many others around the world, we're now very intentionally trying to start organizing uh, old people um, like me. Uh, uh, we've got this uh, third act campaign going here in the States for people over the age of 60, and it's, um, um, it's going pretty well. What um, what what advice do you have for uh, older people and for movements about how to make use of uh, older people who may not come in from quite the same places as uh, as the uh, fresh faced youthful uh, idealists um, um, of the world? Please go ahead, uh, uh, Louisa, because I'm much more closer to the character. <laughs> <laughs> well, you're you're all headed in this. You're all headed in the same direction, guys. Yeah. That's the. So my big inspiration is my grandmother, who has taught me about ecology from you know the age of I don't know four, and I'm currently writing a book with her. So there's a self-serving answer, and it's the most it's the most exciting experience of all because she's 89 now, and she is outraged. And I don't know how you conserve your outrage for almost nine decades, but she certainly did. And she would, you know, she has been an activist for a long time, a very different kind of activist, but you know, that kind of activist that you are when you're 90 and you've seen a lot, you know, a lot of the world changing when she was born, there were 2 billion people on the planet. So there is just a lot of change. And um, when I, uh, when I when I speak to here to her, we 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 and we when we go to events, we often the youngest and the oldest person in the room, and we are what economists consider unproductive, and uh, we are what politicians consider not as relevant, in our you know minds and you know politician like politics isn't made for us, and our opinions even though they are you know ideal idealist on a way, aren't considered as, uh, yeah as you know important and what i feel is her generation i think that accounts for younger people as well they are so radical in their thinking and bill if any how possible embrace that embrace that um that rigor that is there because you have just seen a bit more of the world um you know uh take out, you know, take out the, the question of, you know, what are people supposed to do and what kind of time of their life, but open the space for people who are looking back on their lives and wonder, you know, what am I leaving to my children, my grandchildren? And I think there's so much to, to gain from that. And one thing, one, you know, you ask for advice, one thing is people need to talk to their children and their grandchildren. 
because we need to stop this tendency that generation just lose each other's you know children move out and they forget what their parents taught them and they start their own life and at some point you know nobody talks to each other anymore and uh, when there is this one weapon that we have there's a superpower that we have is that we have the people you know debating on the breakfast table and around the christmas tree and around you know the any kind of festivity that is going on and it's it's families and and friends and those relationships where you're brutally honest about things, and this is it is something we mustn't we mustn't lose, but we must uh, you know hold dear to and and empower. And uh, after you know talking my heads away with my grandmother, I can very much say it's worth it. <laughs> Good. Well, thank you so much, Luisa, for that answer, uh, Bill. I'm uh, trying to share a, uh, a little graphic to try to answer that question. Uh, let's see if I succeed, but uh, do you see this graphic on the screen? Yes. Okay, so one of the things that we need to do in all our movements is try to ensure that people have multiple pathways of participation. We need to ensure that we are creating different areas of interest so people can participate based on their interests, their knowledge, their capability, their love, their affection for things. We have to make activism lovely, passionate, happy, community building, and so on. In what lies ahead for all movements, including movements of older people and uh, grandparents, is we have to make these movements life-giving and uh, joy announcing because let's be clear there are tough times ahead so i won't go into the detail of the image in front of you but basically people have power in multiple different ways and activism especially organized formalized activism needs to take care that in because we start off with how people are marginalized excluded and so on that sometimes we focus too much on what people don't have rather than what people still have as a result of all the oppression, marginalization, colonial exploitation and so on that people have had. So I think there's a mindset change that we need in all movements. And not to say that many movements already don't have it, but it's not the norm and it's not the majority. Uh, so whether it is uh, you know, taking uh, action as voters, whether it is engaging in arts and culture, whether it's thinking about how we use our consumer power, how we use our uh, wealth and so on. This is not a complete list. This We have to create multiple ways so that people can participate, not how those of us sitting in full-time sort of civil society jobs imagine it to be, but we have to be thinking about where people are and how people can be enabled to participate and enter, because it's only when we have sufficient numbers, substantially larger than we are able to mobilize at this moment. Will our political and business leaders eventually be pushed to act with the urgency that the situation calls for? Failure to do that, I think, will be a failure of activism if we cannot create the multiple ways in which people can participate based on their own knowledge, interests, and capabilities. Thank you. Good answer. Well, we're coming to the end of the time here. So let me just finish with one more set of questions about um, activism and how we do it. Um, you know, environmentalists have always been better at the appealing to the part of the human brain that likes bar graphs and pie charts and stuff, and not so much to the more visceral. Um, but I think we're starting to do a better job of bringing music and things into these movements. So What's on your playlist right now? What song is uh, getting you up in the morning and uh, uh, keeping you going through the day? Lisa. Uh, I love this question. I'm just checking. Um, so there is a lot, um, a lot of music uh, that is taking place in our activism. We invite artists to our strikes and right now I listen a lot um, to uh, a, th a song called Icarus. Um, I feel a change when they a lot. Excellent. Okay. 
Okay. Uh, for me, it's a kind of sad answer to the question. It's a song that my late son, uh, it was the first one he performed publicly called Tell Me Why in 2009. And it was uh, asking why is there no action on deforestation, environment collapse, inequality, and so on. It's not yet been publicly released, but it's the song that's in my head every day. But I'm happy to say that one of the things that I'm fully focused on right now in terms of my volunteer efforts and so on is to try to figure out how to promote artivism, which is the bringing together of the worlds of arts and culture and the world of activism in a respectfully, mutually beneficial relationship where we can help each other be much better than we currently are in terms of impact. And I don't believe that this on its own will solve the huge challenge that we face, but I believe it is a critical, I believe without it, we do not have a chance because if we cannot communicate on a much larger scale through dance, through song, through even things like gaming, right? If we understand the complexity of culture today, whether we like it or not, 1.2 billion people in the world are spending huge amounts of time on various gaming uh, platforms, generally playing games where people are beating and killing each other and lots of blood and so on. How do we get into that industry and how do we get people in those industries to use their talents to develop games where people can go into a deforested area and find ways of getting points where you can actually rebuild a forest and kind of inspire imagination? Because let's be very clear, one of the things that is most critically missing at the moment is an absence of imagination. And we got to get people to imagine that it is within our grasp to turn this thing around. True, the window is small. The window of opportunity is small and it's closing fast. But let's be very clear. This moment of history that we find ourselves in is one where we have to say that pessimism is a luxury that we simply cannot observe, uh, uh, afford. And that whatever the pessimism of our analysis might be at different moments, we can overcome that pessimism best by the optimism of our creativity, of our energy, and of our actions that seek to make change, even if we don't win the struggle immediately uh, the next day. Thank you. That's a great answer. And Kumi, maybe we can use this opportunity to try and get that track of your sons out for people to hear. I know I would love to hear it. And um, I am um, just, I can't thank both of you enough for um, sitting down today, but mostly for all the good work day in, day out, every single day. So uh, bless you all. And I, I think we're, uh, uh, Anne, Simone, Mark, I think we're, we've done our work here. This has been an absolutely fascinating discussion. I've been around and covering activists for many decades, and I learned a lot today, and I am very confident that the many, many, many people that you will reach through this interview will also learn a lot and be inspired and instructed. So thank you all very much. Special thanks to Kumi uh, for soldiering through despite COVID. Uh, extra thanks to Louisa for joining us from far across the land. And uh, Neil, is there anything else on your end? And there was just the one question if, if Kumi and Luisa still have time to answer that, but I mean, Kumi wrapped it up so nicely just now. Um, it was a question of, you know, whether activism has to be taken to a next level, whether we need a more radical approach, whether civil disobedience is the next step, or perhaps there's a step beyond that, where we actually have to, you know, target certain infrastructures. And how do they feel about that, a radicalization of activism? I, 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 think, folks. I, I think this was a very important one. and, and uh, Luisa, if you're okay, uh, let's have a short attempt, both of us, to answer the question. I'm happy to go first uh, on it. So um, this moment is one of extreme concern. I fully understand the deep frustration, anger, and disappointment of millions of people, hundreds of millions of people, I would say, not just young people, by the way, across generations who have lost their faith in our political leaders to stand up to the fossil fuel industry because they say the right thing, but they don't act. So now in this context, 
people are thinking, what are the limits of activism, right? And I want to say, they, you're never going to get one answer. I'm just going to offer you my answer, the best of my ability. That I believe that violence serves those in power's interests, right? The use of violence in resistance will be turned around as it is already being turned around in the tiny few cases that there is violence that is offered by different movements. And, they are, and it's usually very, very small. You see how an approach of Ajahn ship on the part of, uh, and I can quote you examples. I could quote you examples from the G8 in the US, in, uh, sorry, the big amigos meeting it was. And there was, uh, the three amigos meetings, there was, uh, you know, peaceful demonstrations and the people organizing it, you know, were suddenly finding, oh, there's somebody trying to instigate that violence. And then it turned out that the person was wearing his RCMP boots uh, and was part of the police and the police were trying to instigate that violence because they wanted to turn the message. Bear in mind in both countries that claim to be democracies, as those that, are, that don't make such claims, these tactics are being used across the board. So therefore, I would say strategically, tactically, and ethically, the use of violence does not serve the struggle for climate justice. Now, it will never serve it in the future. Having said that, intensifying peaceful civil disobedience is absolutely, absolutely justified. Bill, myself, and others have been uh, advocating for this for you know more than a decade i think there's a lot of room to creatively increase civil disobedience without necessarily alienating also those that sometimes come up against it so um so yes i would end by saying that one of the targets for the civil disobedience if i were to be able to together with luisa you know wave a magic wand and turn activism in a particular direction, I would say, let's mobilize everybody to go after all the financial institutions uh, surrounding them peacefully, ensuring that they take notice, uh, uh, making them the front end targets. Because bear in mind, sometimes when there's a company building a bank in the Amazon, uh, a dam in the Amazon, that company, that dam company, sorry, the company building the dam as no market exposure, you can't campaign. Even to win a battle like that, you follow the money, you find the bank, that bank has market exposure. And as Luisa correctly said, these institutions today cannot be mindless about their reputational capital and their relational capital. They are much more vulnerable than we think they are. And therefore using civil disobedience against them intensifying it at whatever level, keeping it peaceful, is something that I would support very strongly. Um, yeah, I think on a tactical note, I think sitting down with the 195 oil and gas carbon bombs, you know, and looking at them and find, you know, and, 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 and splitting it up and going to the investors one by one and to the insurances one by one, I think that's basically the task ahead. They need to be stopped. Um, adding to the to the question of you know tactics and so on, I don't have much to add, except that I just find it irritating how how linear we talk of what is radical and what's not. So I'm thinking of my grandma with 89. For her, it's a very radical thing to pop on her bike bike and come to to our climate strike in the city center. That's for a lady in her age is a very radical thing to do. Radical is something radicality that is something. That is that's also personal, that has that is uh, subjective, that isn't something we can pull on a line and say this is better activism and this is less good activism, this is you know effective and it's not, and this is a necessary next step. It comes down to from where we are coming from and what is radical always is something to do with capacities. And so we need to ask people to use the capacities, but this is all individual. And it's, I think, you know, Kumi talked about making, making the climate movement and uh, the climate spaces um, fun and loving and, so on that has to do with acknowledging and accepting those those differences and and what people can give and how far people can go and this is not you know necessarily um, one thing isn't more effective than the other and I sometimes feel it's a very there's a very under complex story about you know when you protest on the street and hasn't worked out immediately the next thing you have to do automatically 
is 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 blocking because it can be very very effective and i'm you know i'm 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 talking about civil disobedience a lot we started that you know climate strikes where civil disobedience and their their beginnings and yet it has to come down to us finding you know not out just what we can do but why we do something and uh, as kumi uh, so importantly pointed out we need to be faster better smarter we need to more we need to be brighter and better and more just and uh, not turn what we're fighting against into our own weapons because as you rightly pointed out uh, that leads uh, that leads nowhere <laughs>